2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is God-breathed yes. and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This is the word of the Lord. Here I am, amening with my microphone on. Couldn't help myself. I didn't know it was on, though. <laughs> well, it's good to see each of you here today in service, and what a wonderful time we've already had. That last song just hits me every time, man. I'll tell you. You know, while it while worship starts in the mind, how we think about God, it does move into the emotion. Don't let anyone tell you that uh, experiential, that, that feeling, sensing the presence of God and knowing the spirits in you, that you can't feel that and that you can't emote over what you know. That's a good thing. Just don't start with the emotion. Uh, start with what you know of God. Well, we're going to be in the Word of God today, and you know, we're in this series, Big Questions, and... Today, uh, we're going to tackle the question, is the Bible reliable? Um, I don't, I'm not convinced that most evangelicals, not some, most, do not believe the Bible is reliable. I think if there was a poll, and there are many polls, and they reflect this, that People will say, most, like 60% of evangelicals will say the Bible's reliable, so a, a, a slim majority. But even of the 60% that say that, they don't live it as if it's reliable. It's amazing, but we need to think about this. The way you think about God says a lot about the way you live. And it doesn't begin with doing. It starts with knowing. But knowing translates into doing. And, and being in the Word of God is critical for those who believe it's reliable because they know that without it, there's nothing in this world that is reliable. It's the only thing I can trust. And so today what I want to do is I want to come along as one of the shepherds of this flock to, I want to, I want to encourage you, I want to push you towards reading your word, the word of God, and studying the word of God this year. I mean, if you ask, what's the greatest thing you can do in 2023? I'll tell you what the greatest thing is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that includes prayer, and that includes reading the Bible. It needs to be a regular part of your daily life, getting into the Word of God. God's Word should always take a front seat in our lives because what you believe about God is the most important thing about you. And, you, and what you believe about the Bible determines whether what you believe about God is worth believing in the first place. If you say you believe in God, but all of your beliefs and opinions are based on your ideas, and, and not the Word of God, then that's a poor belief system. The Bible addresses every question, every subject, every concern that you'll ever face in this life. And it will provide the greatest level of comfort, peace, and strength that you will need to get through the trials that are, that are sure to come and many of you are facing right now. There is no trial that you're facing or suffering that God's Word does not bring strength and comfort and assurance to you in. And when we get to a point where we say, I'm just overwhelmed, the first thing that ought to go off in your mind, the first flag ought to rise, and it ought to say, have you been in the Word? See, what happens when we have a problem is we focus on the problem. We lose sight of the greatness of our God. But when you go to Isaiah chapter 40, like we read this morning, or many other passages in the Psalms, 
that describe the greatness of God, all of a sudden as you're reading and you're letting your mind be washed over with the Word, all of a sudden those problems that were just killing you, they become smaller because you know your God is greater. Scotty read for us the passage in this, the reading. Today we're going to be in a lot of Scripture, so if you have a, pe a pen and paper, you're going to want it to write down some Scripture passages, but what he read was so true. This is what the Bible says. This is, how, this is what God says about himself. He says, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Why? Why should we do that? Why should we study the Word? So that the man or the woman of God, <laughs> excuse me, may be completely equipped for every good work. Amen? You don't want to go to toe-to-toe -to -toe with God on your personal opinion of who, of who he is, especially when you know that he wrote a book to tell you who he is. You want to know what the book says. And but the Bible is God's own testimony to himself. It's, it's, it's his self-disclosure. Consider what great length God went to reveal himself to you. Did you know the Bible's made up of 66 books? 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. Every single book is a revealing, has a revealing truth about God to use so that we might know him and rest securely in his self-revelation as truth. No other ancient manuscript comes close to the accuracy and the dependability of God's word. Take the New Testament for one. Let's just go to the New Testament. It is constantly under attack of critics who question the reliability and act accuracy of the text. If, if the critics want to disregard the New Testament, then they must also disregard the ancient writings of Plato, Aristotle, and Homer. It really isn't open for debate. The early copies of manuscripts for those writers compared to the early manuscripts for the New Testament aren't even comparable. And yet people will believe in those three writers and what they wrote, and that they wrote it. But they will not believe that God wrote the Bible. Plato's earliest manuscripts were dated 1,200 years after he wrote them. And there are only seven copies in existence today. Yet you will not find a single scholar who questions the validity of Plato's writings after applying textual criticism. Aristotle's writings are dated 1,400 years after he wrote them. How many copies? 49. Homer's Iliad, this is the document that next to the Bible is the most attested of all ancient literature. The earliest copies are dated 500 years after he wrote it. How many copies? 643. And no one questions Homer as the author of that work. What about the New Testament? The earliest copies of manuscript that we have for the New Testament were written less than 100 years from the time the events took place. How many copies do we have? 5,686 copies of Greek manuscripts in existence today. By the way, textual criticism applied to the Bible is far greater than any other manuscript because of the vast number of copies in existence. The more copies you have to compare, the greater the textual criticism, the more valid it is, uh, and, the, and the level of scrutiny and accuracy that you can determine. The findings, get this, the New Testament is 99.5% textually pure. Only one half of 1% is inaccurate. And the inaccuracies are not in substance. They are in spelling and grammar. 5,800 copies. But quite honestly, it's even more than that. I mentioned we have 5,686 copies of Greek manuscript, but that doesn't include the manuscripts written in Syriac, Latin, Coptic, and Aramaic languages. If you add those in, you have over 24 thousand copies of ancient manuscript of the New Testament. Again, second place, Homer's Iliad, 
643 copies. The world and all the intelligent people of the world do not question Homer's Iliad, that they will not give God credit, even though he made it extremely clear. The truth is, the evidence for the reliability of the, of the Bible that you hold in your hand is head and shoulders above any other ancient manuscript. Why do I bring this up? Because the level of attack against the Bible has always been head and shoulders above all the other ancient manuscripts. This is why it's so important, church, that, that uh, we know the truth about the Bible because the Christian faith is built upon the confidence and the reliability and the surety and the veracity of the Word of God. Any true believer will base their life on it. Those who are playing a game with God will not. They won't read it. They'll talk about it. They'll quote a scripture verse, but they will not spend time in the Word of God. If you're a true believer of God, there is something in you by the Holy Spirit compelling you to open the Bible. That doesn't mean that all true Christians read the Bible, but you are convicted if you don't. In fact, right now, some of you are probably feeling conviction. You should be thankful for that. Because that means the Spirit of God's in you. And that's a good starting point. You can't, if he's not in you, you wouldn't understand the Bible if you tried to read it. You want to be saved. So what do we believe about the Bible? You're ready to write something down? Let's write these down. I want everybody at Bureau Bible Fellowship, in this one flock of God, I want you to understand what it is exactly that we believe about the Bible. Number one, it's infallible. It does not lead to error. That's what that means. It does not lead to wrong conclusions. It does not teach erroneous doctrines. The Bible is infallible. Number two, it's inerrant. Inerrant. That means in the smallest part, each word in the original manuscript is without error. Thirdly, it's authoritative. What the Bible says is binding on the lives of God's people. What the Bible says is binding on the lives of God's people. You can't get caught up in certain doctrines and make that your theme song and parade around with a flag waving that particular doctrine and leave the rest of the Bible out. By doing that, that's sin. The sin is that you're not allowing the whole Scripture to have meaning and purpose in your life. You've attached yourself to something that hinders you from seeing the whole. Jesus didn't just quote certain Scriptures out of a certain book. He quoted all over the Old Testament. And everything he said is the New Testament. Jesus believed in the Bible. All of it. We should be studying all of it. Let me give you another one. Number four. The Bible is immutable. Immutable. That means if God wrote it, then it carries His nature. It's absolute. It's indispensable. It's indisputable. It's irreversible, and it's unalterable. The Bible carries God's nature of eternality. Isaiah 40, verse 8, we were just there in Isaiah 40 this morning. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. It's settled in heaven. It ought to be settled in your heart, believer. Number five, the Bible is trustworthy. The Bible is believable. It has the strongest objective support for biblical inspiration and authority in the testimony of Jesus himself. Matthew chapter, write this down, Matthew 5, 18. Listen to what Jesus said. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, and that would be when the Lord returns, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Jesus is saying the entire Bible will be completely accomplished before he returns. 
Matthew 24, 35. Matthew 24, 35. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Matthew 4, 4. Matthew 4, 4. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The entire Bible is breathed out by God. Man should live by the whole Bible. And every word that proceeds out is what you live on. Amen? See, Jesus believed that in total. This is the inspired word of God. Do you believe that? How will you deal with Jesus' testimony on the authority of God's word? If you believe Jesus is the Son of God, and you, you can't backstep on the authority of Scripture. And I'm afraid a lot of Christians have done that. They believe Jesus is the Son of God. They've received Him in their heart. They've gotten saved. But they backstep on the Bible. Well, I just don't like certain parts of the Bible. They, you look at their Bible, and there's pages worn out, and then there's a whole bunch of pages that haven't even been opened yet. They take bits and pieces of the Bible, and that's where they live. They won't study the entire Word of God. Listen, friend, Jesus is a divine Savior. Either He's a divine Savior, and the Bible is infallible, as He said, or neither is true. You can't have Jesus be the Savior and have an infallible Bible, because Jesus said the Bible's not, in, it's not it, well, there's no error. It's infallible. You've got to make up your mind. Do I believe Jesus is the Son of God? Do you? And if you do, then you ought to be in the Word. The tactic of popular criticism today is to simply question the Bible. They'll read a text. You know, you go to some church and, and Sunday school class or a small group, and they'll read a passage, and then the, the, the group leader will say, so, so, so how, does that pass, how does that passage feel to you? Or they'll say, so what is the passage saying to you? Giving you full right to say your opinion for what you think that passage means. Hogwash! That's ridiculous! This is not some idea that you get to mull over and come up with your own conclusion. This is God's Word. This is God's testimony. This is God's opinion. Who has an opinion greater than God's opinion? We never want to be that in that, that person that does that. But the world will say, well, maybe it's true. Maybe it's not true. That, that's the modern, that's the, the, uh, the, the, the church that started back in the 2000s. You know, we came out of the seeker-sensitive church, and then all of a sudden you started having this emerging church. And the emergence, uh, it means you meet in a room like this, but you set up uh, carpet, Put down some, lay down some, some, not carpet, but some rugs, and then you have some couches that are comfortable and chairs, some some bean bags, you know, where people can just kind of hang out. Let's light some candles uh, around the room so that it has a sacred moment to it, you know, and then let's uh, let's 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 question, let's read the text, and then let's, well, that could be true. They're taking their script from the world. The Bible's not to be treated that way, friends. You have a, listen, let me, let me say this. Because this is real important. Turn to Psalm 19.7. Why don't we just let God's word tell us whether it's true or not, rather than us in our own opinions decide that. I want to take you to a passage where it's actually Psalm 19, verses 7 through 9 is a summary statement of the entire Psalm 119. Isn't that interesting? You could read Psalm 119. It's the longest chapter in the Bible. And one time, uh, a pastor was invited to come and speak at a guest church. And in his church, he always read the text that he was going to preach, like we do here. Uh, and they said, we want, we want you to teach Psalm 119. So he got up, and he literally read in that guest church the entirety of Psalm 119 before he preached. 
Could you imagine what the people were thinking? He was not going to cut short the word of God. You asked me to do it. I'm here. Let's go. And he read it. But Psalm 19, 7 through 9, is a summary. It says this, the law, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So in those three verses, it describes the Bible in different ways. It's the law, it's the testimony, it's the precepts, uh, it, it's the commandment. It's, uh, he goes down, he, he lists what the Bible is. And then he gives the outcome of the Bible and each of these titles for the Bible. The test, well, I want to I wanna go back to verse, uh, I think it's uh, 7b, the latter part of the verse there. The testimony of the Lord is sure. Because we're talking about reliability. Is the Bible reliable? You could give your opinion on it. Who cares? Your opinion doesn't amount to a you know, hill of beans. When you die, your opinion will die with you. It's not going to live after you. And before you came here, your opinion, opinion didn't matter. didn't exist. But guess what's going to be here before and after you die? God. God's opinion. So why not go with it? Testimony. What does that mean? The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise and simple. Testimony is personal witness to one's experience. You go to a courtroom, when somebody is brought forward to testify, they can only testify to their personal experience. Well, guess what? God is giving his personal testimony about the veracity of his word. That's what the Bible is. It's God's own self-disclosure. That's what Psalm 19, 7 through 9 is. This is God's personal testimony. And he says, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. I want you to listen to this. There are two Hebrew words that are translated into English for the word uh, for the word simple. We see that word simple here, wise and simple, making wise and simple. The word of God makes, make, makes wise the simple. Okay, so, so the first word uh, is translated, uh, uh, it, it's, it's translated as sincere. Sincere. Uh, the theme verse for our church, 2 Corinthians 11.3, but I'm afraid that as the serpent has deceived Eve with his craftiness, that you might also be led astray from the simple and pure devotion to Christ, from the sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So it means sincere. But the other Greek word, or Hebrew word rather, for simple, translates in English as ignorance. Ignorance. One without understanding, one who does not know. But it has a concrete idea to it. Why? Because it's in the Hebrew language. The Hebrew language is very concrete. Unlike the Greek, which is esoteric, you know, it's philosophical, theoretical. Hebrew is very concrete as opposed to being abstract. And the idea of being simple-minded is the idea of an open door. Interesting. Ignorance at the root form, is a picture of an open door. A person says, well, I'm open-minded, and they're proud of it, right? People in the world, I know Christians that say that. Well, I want to be open-minded. They don't realize it, but the Jews would interpret that person as making a public statement of ignorance. That's what they just did in the Hebrew language. A person says, I'm an agnostic. Really? Yes, I'm an agnostic. That means one who does not know. Ag agonos uh, is one who does not know. Remind them that the Latin equivalent of uh, not knowing, of being agnostic, the Latin equivalent is ignoramus. You rarely hear someone say, well, I'm an ignoramus. <laughs> But that's what they are. They're admitting it. And what they're saying at the root level in the Hebrew language is, I'm just an open door. Anything can come in and anything can go out. I don't really care. And I've got to say to you, that's not wise. 
And you'll never be discerning. And you'll never be able to discriminate. I know what's indiscrimination. I know how that word is a hot topic word in this culture, but it's a good word. Discriminate is a good word in the Bible. God wants you to be able to discriminate between what is right and what is wrong, between what is fallible, what is erroneous, and what is true. If you told the Apostle Paul that you were open-minded, he would say, close the door. You need to know what to keep in and what to keep out. And I've used this example in the past, and I'll just say it again because it's so simple, but it's a simple analogy that works, and that is nobody in this room has a home that they leave the front door wide open. Why? Because, well, first and foremost, because there's stuff on the inside you don't want to get out. If you've got kids, you, you might open the door and leave the screen door closed and locked so the kids can't get out and get some air. But otherwise, you leave the door open, or the door closed. And why? Because most of the year here, it's hot. We want air conditioning. You don't want the air getting out, so you close the door. And for many of you today, you have a camera system set up on your front door or close to the front door. So you can see, you can discriminate, you can discern who's at the door and whether or not you want them to come in. That is a good thing. That's what the Bible is saying. The Bible says, don't leave the front door open and the back door where anybody can walk in and walk out, whatever they want, and you're just this ignoramus letting it all happen. Don't be that person. The Bible here in this text says, God will make you skilled at life, making wise the simple. It's not just theoretical. It's truth in the mind that shows up in your life. We're not talking about spinning off theories here. We're talking about knowing what is right. To know what is right means to be in the Word of God, studying the Word of God, that I might be able to even great with greater clarity know to discern and discriminate in this lost and fallen world what is right from wrong and not get sucked in to a culture that longs to inculcate you and your children into worldly belief systems. You truly want to have, as a believer, a biblical worldview. Amen? But the Bible is believable. Did you know that the Bible is preeminent among all literature? You stack up all the books of all time against the Bible, and again, second place isn't even close. Listen to this. The New York Times bestseller, to make the New York Times bestseller list, you have to sell between 10,000 and 100,000 copies. Okay? Uh, in, in a year. In a year. Let's put a, it's in a year, annually. Um, how many Bibles are sold in the, bio, in the United States annually? Well, Bibles that are sold, let's go with 25 million every year. At least 25, the number's going up. Back in 2013 or 14, it was 20, 20 million. Now it's 25 million. And that's just the U.S. The fact is the Bible is the best-selling book of, of the year every single year. You think the New York Times will acknowledge it? They wouldn't because it would be boring. Every year the Bible wins. The top New York Times bestseller. United Bible, the United Bible Societies report that their network of organizations distributed 633 million portions of Scripture. So now we're not talking about Bibles that are sold. Now we're just talking about Bibles that are given. 633 million portions of Scripture throughout the world. And that was back in 2000. Think what it is now. In 2008, USA Today reported that Gideon's International distributed 76 million Bibles that year. That's an average of 1.5 million Bibles every seven days. The Gideons, man, they were on it. I couldn't find, I looked everywhere, I couldn't find a more recent Gideon statistic. I wanted to know what that would be now, because back then, you know, uh, 76 million in 2008. So the Bible is preeminent in circulation. What sets it apart from all other religious books? What is it? What, what, what makes the Bible so unique, okay? You might want to write these down. It's the only book that gives the account of special creation. There are other books that, that give ideas of creation. 
and other books that even uh, through oral through oral tradition, what the Bible tells you clearly, oral traditions travel, and so even the Asian community has their ideas about the flood, but they don't call it that. They they, they know something happened in certain parts of the world. But the Bible gives you the clarity and the account of special creation. Secondly, it's the only book that gives a continuous uh, uh, historical record from the origin of man to man's present era, that's you and I, to man's future. What other book will do that? The only ones that that attempt that are fiction. The Bible's not fiction. It's historically accurate in the science community. They've not been able to disprove the Bible. You know how frustrating that must be for a, a for a, a agnostic or an atheist scientist to not be able to get rid of the Bible? Ask Lee Strobel about that. He was one of the, I think, was he at the editor level of the Chicago Tribune? I, th- I think he was, he was certainly an author or, and, and a writer for the Chicago Tribune. And he went out, one of his, he was writing an article, he was going to write an expose on the Bible and prove that it's not true. And I think it took a year, year and a half of study, and he researched and he went everywhere. I mean, talking about a, a, a Chicago Tribune, you know, writer, a solid, well-respected writer. They do their homework. And he, at the end of it, he got saved and believed the Bible. How frustrating it must be for atheists. And he was an atheist. How frustrating. Let me give you another one. It's the only book that gives history a purpose. A true purpose. You, if you're a believer and you're in the Word, you know the future. The world doesn't. The world's guessing. And when you tell them what the future is, oh, well, you know, I'm not sure about that. I don't believe that. On their opinion. I'm getting another one. It is by far the purest religious literature with the highest moral standards. Here's another. It's the only book of antiquity containing detailed prophecies of future events with accuracy. They come true. The prophets in the Old Testament, they spoke the truth. Because we we have now on our side the proof of their accuracy. See, now here's, here's what makes the Bible fascinating to me. Because if you think about a great book that was written, it was written by one author, and he wrote it over a span of time. Let's say he took his time and he wrote it over a span of 10 years. And we go, wow, he put the time into that one. That was an incredible book. Every word has a meaning and everything fits. Wow, let me blow you away. God used 40 different authors to record his word. Shepherds, farmers, political and religious leaders, even kings. Together, these authors lived over a period of 1,500 years. They didn't know each other. They couldn't conspire together to write the Bible. They lived on three different continents when you didn't travel from one continent to another. The authors lived over a span of 1,500 years. Let me put that in context. That's the same amount of time as from the beginning of the Middle Ages until now. That's how long it took through 40 different authors on three different continents for the Bible to be completely formulated by God. And it's all, as it was read to us in the passage this morning, All was God-breathed. You say, how do you know that? Because the Bible is 100% harmonious. It all fits. It all fits. Who could possibly mastermind such a book that is written with 40 authors on three continents over a span of 1,500 years and in the end have a book with such harmony in the message, such accuracy in historical events and integrity in scientific details. It makes you wonder why so many people reject the Bible as the Word of God. It makes me wonder why so many Christians aren't reading it. 
and studying it. The reason's obvious why the world doesn't, because it's the only book that calls people to true accountability. The Bible's a book of authority. It should be the authority over our lives. That's what they don't want. I don't want God to be over me. Therefore, I reject his word. Yet the Bible has stood the test of time, even with all the attacks. As much as a man has tried, he's failed miserably in his attempt to destroy the Bible. Many have tried to discredit the reliability of the Bible, but archaeological discoveries continue to happen, even to this day, that consistently prove the Bible's credibility and indestructibility. Let me give you one. Truth is, the Bible's way ahead of science. The, the history book gives credit to Pythagoras, who lived in the 6th sixth, sixth century B.C. They give him credit for initiating the idea that the world is round. I guess he never read the scroll of Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 22, that I read to you this morning, where it says, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth. That book was recorded 200 years before Pythagoras. For centuries, professors said, there are no Hittite people on the earth that ever lived on the earth. The Bible talks about these Hittites, and it does. It, it actually mentions the Hittites 48 times. And that proves the Bible's a fantasy, fictional work. Uh, until the late 19th century, when archaeologists archeolo discovered a letter written by the Hittite king to the Egyptian king. Oops. So just how indestructible is the Bible? Psalm 119.89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Many a philosopher have tried and failed to de completely destroy the Bible and its, and its influence. Voltaire, an atheist, said, quote, 50 years from now, the world will hear no more of the Bible. 50 years later, the British Museum paid the Russian government $500,000 for one copy of a Greek manuscript of Scripture. In that same year, the year of Voltaire's prediction, the first edition of Voltaire's book sold in a Parisian bookstore for less than eight cents. By the way, 50 years after Voltaire's death, he said in 50 years, remember his quote, a prominent organization purchased Voltaire's home and set up a printing press. The name of the organization, the Geneva Bible Society. Does God have a sense of humor or what? World leaders have tried and failed. Diocletian, the Roman emperor, tried the most concerted attack against both Christians and the word of God. In 303 AD, he issued proclamations that every single manuscript of the Bible be burned. Of course, Christians resisted. So the imperial government then demanded that the scriptures be given up or face execution. He delivered on his promise and burned so many Christians in manuscripts that he finally erected a column in Rome or an Ark of Triumph, the and this is what it said, the name of Christians has been extinguished. Talk about failure? Just 22 years later, the church council met at Nicaea and enthroned the Bible as the only infallible judge of truth in the world. Some extinction, huh? See, many in the academic community have tried to laugh the Bible out of existence. Just over 200 years ago, Thomas Paine, one of the great geniuses of his era, presented the, the Age of Reason. That whole book, that work was written to destroy the Bible, to destroy Christianity. He felt that his arguments would forever destroy the Bible. When he, he, here's what he said, quote, When I get through, there will not be five Bibles left in America 200 years ago. The truth is the Bible has consistently outlived its pallbearers. I love what Billy Sunday said about the Bible. Now, this was a fire, fire, Holy Ghost fire preacher, Pentecostal preacher. But before Billy Sunday got saved, he was a Major League Baseball player. Now listen to what he said. 
When I received Christ with the Holy Spirit as my guide, I entered at the portico of Genesis. I walked down the corridor of the Old Testament and the art gallery where pictures of Noah and Abraham and Moses and Joseph and Isaac and Jacob and Daniel hung on the wall. I passed into the music room of the Psalms where the Spirit sweeps the keyboard of nature until it seems that every reed and pipe in God's organ uh, responds to the harp of David, the sweet singer of Israel. I enter the chamber of Ecclesiastes where the voice of the preacher is heard and into the conservatory of Sharon where the lily of the valley, where sweet spices filled and perfumed my life. I entered the business office of Proverbs and on into the observatory of the prophets where I saw telescopes of various sizes pointing to far off events, concentrating mostly on the bright and morning star which was to rise above the moonlit hills of Judea for our salvation and redemption. I entered the audience room of the King of Kings, catching a vision written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then into the correspondence room where Paul and Peter and James and John and Jude wrote their epistles. I stepped into the throne room of Revelation where tower the glittering peaks where sits the King of Kings upon the throne of glory, and I cried out, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let every prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. That fires me up. Man, I can go Pentecostal on that now. They are our brothers and sisters. there There are some of them in this room. They're showing great respect to this body by not just going all out on us. I remember going, when I, this is way off point, but got to share it. Um, I, back in the 80s, I, I really did have a desire to learn more about the charismatic movement. So I, I went to these conferences all over the place. And I went to Rockwall, Texas, and I, I went to a pastor's conference. And then in the evenings, we got to worship with the body. The, the worship center held 10,000. And that church was known for rising at, 6 a.m., meeting at 6 a.m. and praying. And there would be 300 people in that room praying. It's pretty powerful. But in that evening worship service where the body joined the pastors, the church body would come in for the evening service. And the worship is, I mean, it's, it's all out going, man. I mean, it's happening. And I kept hearing right behind me this voice go, about every two minutes, you know? And I thought, my goodness, what's going on back here? I turned around, a little old lady. And she's got her praise on, man. She's just enjoying the presence. Of, at first, I was uh, uh, irritated by it. What in the world? It, we're in church. I turned around, looked at her. She looked at me with the biggest smile. So happy in Jesus. There are brothers and sisters. They will be in heaven with you. I hope you're there. I hope those who claim to be Pentecostal will be there. But we need to stop worrying about what other people think about the Bible. Stop trying to be cool and fit in with this world. God called you out of the world, right? When you follow God, you follow what looks foolish in the eyes of the world. Being foolish for Christ's sake is a good thing. It's worth it. Let the world say you're a fool. You be a fool for Jesus. Imagine how foolish Noah looked to the world. What are you building? Building an ark. What's an ark? I don't know. But God told me to build it because there's going to be rain. What's rain? I don't know. Imagine how foolish Noah looked. Imagine how foolish Moses looked trying to protect the Israelites from Pharaoh's army when all he had to work with was a Red Sea in front of him and a rod in his hand and Pharaoh's army pressing down. How foolish did Sarah look to her girlfriends when she was sewing clothes for a baby and they said, Sarah, whose baby? And she said, mine. What are you talking about? That's foolishness. You're 90 years old. 
How foolish did the Israelites look doing laps around the walls of Jericho? How foolish did David look carrying a slingshot to battle against a giant? How foolish did that little boy look when he offered his lunch to feed 20,000 people? 5,000 men and children and, and, and others not counted. How foolish did Paul and Silas look singing while locked in stocks and chains in prison? How foolish did a pregnant peasant Jewish girl named Mary look when she turned to her boyfriend Joseph and said, it's God's fault. How foolish did Jesus look hanging on a cross half naked? Beaten beyond recognition while the people laughed at him saying, and you're the Messiah, a king? What you, church, need to remember need to know if you don't know it is that from genesis to revelation god used the foolish to confound the wise noah and his family were saved from the flood moses saw the red sea part and pharaoh's army swallowed up sarah gave birth to isaac the israelites saw the world or the walls of jerusalem or i can't see because i'm tearing up and i'm reading Israelites saw the walls of Jericho come crashing down into a heap. David defeated Goliath and chopped his head off. The little boy's lunch not only fed 20,000, but provided 12, 000, or 12 baskets full of food left over. Paul and Silas walked out of that prison free men. Mary gave birth to the Messiah. Be a fool for Jesus. The whole Bible's made up of fools. From the world's view, how do I get started? Practically speaking, open it. Open your Bible. It can't do you any good if you don't open it. Secondly, chew it up. You say, how do I chew up the Bible? You start with prayer. Before you read it, pray. Because the Holy Spirit's work is to bring to remembrance everything Jesus said. To lead you, guide you into all truth. So ask God to allow the Bible to come alive for you, that he might by his spirit illuminate your heart to what you're reading, and then take one bite at a time. You don't need to read the whole Bible in one setting. Forget about the reading the Bible in one year. Slow down. Start with just a chapter. And if you come into a part of the chapter that really speaks to you, stop there. Meditate on that. God might be using that to say something to you in your life. Ask God to open your eyes to understand it. And then, the last thing about chewing, you got to obey. That's the swallowing part. If you just chew food, and after you chew it for five minutes, you spit it out, didn't do your body any good. You got to swallow the food. You got to obey the word. And then lastly, so it's not just open it up and chew it up, it's live it out. By the Holy Spirit of God, that's what the whole work of sanctification is is to take you as a believer and process you towards God. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Did I take all of them? Well, you bless me. Thank you. I appreciate that. So we've got to live it. You can't just read it. You've got to study it. Chew it up. Swallow it. And when you swallow, what you're doing is you're letting it internalize. You're letting it become you. Just like food is utilized in your, in your stomach. It's processed. It actually is used for you to have fuel, to have strength and health. Spiritually, the Bible is that food. Jesus Christ even said, I am the bread of life. We should take of him every day. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. It's hard for me to even get through this, but I think about it the power of the word of God, that you would disclose yourself to us in that way, that we could know you, that we could grow in you. And no Christians arrived. Nobody has it all together. We're all just, we're just beggars looking for a morsel of bread at your table. And yet you said, no, you're not a beggar. You're my child. Stand, sit at the table. I've got a full buffet of food for you today. Take it in. Grow. Let it strengthen you. Let it give you what you need 
to nourish your body that you might be strong for the Lord in this world. Father, may we do that now. Help us as a people to get started. Help us to just begin taking one chapter a day and just letting pour, praying over it and then letting the Word of God pour over us. And, and, and if we don't understand a text, Lord, I pray that you would guide this body to those that you have appointed as shepherds of this flock, that we would be able to help them understand. And if we don't have the answer, that we would research and we would come to understand that passage so that we could share with them. You gave it to us because it works, but we've got to work it. And so may that happen in the lives of your people at Bureau Bible Fellowship. May it make us greater witnesses to this community and this world. And we give you all the praise and glory for your word. And the praise and glory goes to you because you are our God, you are our Father, you are our, our spiritual Father that gives us everything we need. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite the shepherds that are here, the elders that are present to come forward. And also, we have people who serve in the prayer ministry. If, by the way, you'd like to join those in the prayer ministry, uh, reach out to us this week. Uh, get a hold of Deb. We'd love to invite you to uh, be part of that ministry, but they come as well. And if you have any needs in your life, physical, emotional, financial, whatever, please come and uh, meet with one of them. It, or maybe salvation. You're, you're saying, I want to be saved. They'll explain to you, and it's you that will be praying and trusting God. If you trust God, you're saved. That's the key. you got to repent of sin, and then you put your faith in him. They'll help you with all of that. So please feel free to come forward. We want to be a church that always ministers to the body the best we can. And prayer is the key to it all. Amen? So we will certainly pray with you. Thank you for being here today, church. And make sure you have fellowship now. Put a little icing on the cake today, okay? God bless you.